I'll probably fling my answer and fling the thing across and turn it off. Okay, um, okay, welcome here this afternoon. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> Trisha asked me to report back on um, some of the stuff that I've been seeing happening at conferences, because a couple of times I sort of come back and said, oh, 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 you know, this happened or that happened, saw some great ideas. So what I have done um, this afternoon is put together a combination of things that I've been playing with in the classroom, some strategies and tips um, for, that I've been trialling, particularly with my year nines, um, to make the most of ICTs in English, but also... Um, a whole lot of tips and strategies and resources that I would love to try and I'm planning to try in the future that I've picked up, particularly from learning at schools. Um, earlier this year there were some amazing international speakers who were talking about online projects that they had been participating in. So um, I will show you the work that they've been doing and talk a little bit about the things they um, were doing as well. At any point if you want me to um, slow down, speed up, explain something, um, whatever, just feel free to yell out. Just ignore my camera. I'm, just, I'm trying to practice what I preach this year. One of the things I'm really conscious of is I'm forever suggesting, you know, talking about flipping the classroom and try uploading videos. One of my real personal, professional sort of goals for myself this year is to actually just have a go and trial all those strategies that I keep telling other people are such a good idea. So, you know, to see if they're actually working. Um, so, first up, I, I just wanted to show you the codes that I've used throughout the presentation. With our Teaching as Inquiry project this year, we're of course focusing on thinking, collaboration and differentiation. So, initially I didn't do this, and then as I was going through it and thinking about it in a little bit more depth, I, I realised I use all of these tools, or I want to use all of these tools, because they support one or more of these things. So I've sort of ended up, it's a little bit tweet, but I've ended up coding each of the, the tools according to the usefulness in terms of the tool for differentiation, collaboration, or supporting thinking specifically. The first one I wanted to talk about is something that Bridget and I are working on this year with our e-learning action plan, and that's using discussion forums in Moodle. One of the really powerful things about Moodle are the interactive activities that it provides that aren't so easily accessible on a wiki or a website. And I think um, discussion forums are actually one of the best things about Moodle. And um, I've been using it in a couple of ways. Um, a really straightforward way that I'm using it with my nine English classes, we're having an ongoing, it started off with a what did you read or watch over summer, where they had to post up um, what they were reading and comment on each other's. And that's now turned into an ongoing, so what are you reading and watching? And they just duck in and out. So it's not a hugely active forum, but it's an ongoing forum. And um, I really like how it's laid out. So this is what it looks like when you create the forum. Simply got an add and you read discussion topic down the bottom there, and they click on that if they want to put an initial post up themselves. So um, at the top there, you've got Ashley writing a little post Surprise, surprise about the Hunger Games. And underneath you've got um, some responses that she's had to it. And it's a really nice, clear layout. And from the front summary page, you can see all of the people who have put up a post, and you can see the number of um, replies they've had, and everything's dated really clearly, and it's got a photo of your student, so you know exactly who is involved. So, um, you know, I can see discussion forums, particularly as a thinking tool and a collaborative thinking tool, as being really powerful because it gives them the time and the space um, to both construct questions and post them up and really think about and construct responses over time. So if you want them to keep on going and thinking about an issue, they can come back and forth. And I found that, like anything, if you duck in occasionally as a teacher and reply and acknowledge their, um, their posts or their replies, that's also um, something that gets them using it more often. So um, I can, I've got one of those tutorials on um, the little YouTube channel that shows you how to set up a forum if you haven't done so before. They're really quick and easy to use up. There are several different types of forums you can do that force them to, um, say for instance you wanted to post up a forum but you wanted them to write an answer 
but you wanted there to be a delay before their answer appeared because you didn't want anyone else in the class to see their answer until later on. Like, there's actually one that has a delay period, which is designed to encourage students to put their own original answers up, but then they're all um, shown so, so that they could come back to tomorrow. So there's different types of forums for different purposes. Um, one of the apps that I've found really useful um, this year, if you've got an iPhone, I'm pretty sure there's an Android version as well, as well is the My Moodle app. It's free. And what it allows you to do, um, if you've got it on your iPhone or on your iPad or a smartphone, is it gives you a little button that goes directly to your Moodle account. And you don't need to keep signing in. Once you've logged in once, it's, it's there and it's immediately accessible. The reason I like it is because it gives you a really quick and easy way to upload and add resources to Moodle. Because if you see on the next, that's what it looks like when you go into the App Store, that's what the little front page looks like when you set up. And when you use it, you come to a screen like that. And if you click on Upload, so I might have my iPad or my smartphone in my hand, and I click on Upload and it goes to take a picture or a video or record audio. So if I wanted to as a student, or I wanted to as a teacher, to quickly record a reflection, or take a photo of some work, or take a video, say like I'm doing now, you thought, okay, I'm going to teach the class how to do an essay plan. Okay, I'll just get one of the girls to record that as I'm talking about it. With the click of a button, that is then immediately uploaded to your private files within Moodle. So there's no connecting of the phone and having to find your file and upload it. It happens instantaneously. So you can imagine that sort of spontaneous on the spot wanting to capture some audio, capture some video, or take a photo of something up on the whiteboard that might be useful for them to post up on your Moodle page. You can do it literally in seconds using the My Moodle app. So it's a really um, useful tool to encourage you to do that more spontaneous use of Moodle rather than just you know thinking I'm going to put up all my you know unit plans up there and I'm going to put up a, a discussion forum. This is for that more just day to day. Oh, here's something that's going on in the classroom that might be good for me to capture and to put up on Moodle. And you know it's not just for teachers. Students can use it in exactly the same way. So they can um, take photos and instantly. Hello. Um, they can instantly upload to my private files on my Moodle. So I've just been talking about um, Sarah and Madeline, the My Moodle app. Just saying it's a free app that allows you to log in just once to your Moodle site. And then when you click on the button, you see this little home page and you're already logged into your Moodle site. And if you click on the um, upload button over that side, you get an instant menu that gives you the option of browsing your photo albums taking a picture or video or recording audio, and then as soon as you click the button, it's automatically uploaded into Moodle. So it's a really good way of, like if you want to capture a moment in the classroom or you want to capture a reflection or any resource that you'd like to upload instantaneously to Moodle. The next is a really useful little tool that I've actually been using with my year nines at the moment, and is a fantastic tool for capturing audio um, recordings and without having to have any kind of software or having to upload it um, separately onto a file. And this is called Vocaroo. You simply go to the Vocaroo website, which is vocaroo.com, and you come up with this home screen. And you simply click on the little record button. So if I go up here and we go, we go to the live site, it might take a few minutes to get there. And if I had my microphone plugged in, I would click on that to record, and it would start recording, and it would stop, and then it would ask me if I want to um, either email it to myself, or what we've been doing in my English class is they've been emailing me the embed code. So we're working on our um, The Giver audiobook project, where over the space of just two periods, we've basically co-constructed an entire audiobook, and a, um, or a summary of the, um, the book. So if I show you here, so here's, here's what they look like. If you get an embed code, you get a cute little widget that looks like this on your page. Now the landscape was changing. 
It was a subtle change. Hi. And you know, and we've done that in the space of, I think we've had that one up within half an hour of me explaining the task to them. And you know, you can get a really professional little, like we're, we're going to co-construct an entire audio book with chapter summaries. And it's a way for me to bring that sort of that oral and speaking skills into the classroom. We so often get them to write and sometimes we get them to draw. We don't often get them to capture their voices and just their voices. And one of my one of my other real things for English is working on listening skills and speaking skills. And I think Vocaroo is a really powerful um, tool for doing that. And if I was to take you to my, um, I'll show you what you can do, which is um, really cute. Is you can get a little widget. So when I'm in my um, year nine class my middle page. My little, uh, my students actually have on their page um, that ready to go widget to use on the page. So up in the top right hand corner of my Moodle page they can record their voice from within it, grab the embed code and they can use that and place it somewhere else or they can send it to their own email address. So it's a really nice, quick and easy tool for capturing your voice, for you as a teacher to capture instructions and also for students to um, practice their reading skills. Like I'm, I'm working with Jackie in drama and she's looking at using this tool as a really nice way for her drama students to practice their speaking. So that's Vocaroo and it's free and it's easy and I really like the fact that um, you don't need to um, log in or join the website or download anything. It's one of those, um, just use it from the site. And it can be embedded back into your Moodle course. So you could record some instructions and embed that widget in a section of your, your Moodle site. It'd be good to go. And if you think about your different students, the reasons of I was just saying I've coded all of these according to whether they're good for differentiation, collaboration or thinking, if they sort of support that. And I really like the fact that I think this is a great differentiation tool. Again, our students with learning needs that struggle with a lot of written text, if we can on occasion provide them with oral and spoken versions of instructions that they can refer back to, that could be a really powerful learning tool. And it's um, quick and easy to use, which is what I like about it. Screener is another version of the well, screener is what I use to make all of the tutorials for Moodle. It's again a really nice online tool. You don't have to download any software. You go to the screener website and there's a little button where you press record and a frame appears around your computer screen and um, you just simply record and it records whatever is going on on your computer screen and whatever you're speaking, saying or speaking. So you can narrate things. And um, the way I use this, I sent this out last year, um, and I'm going to play it all for you because you don't need the entire handout narrated. But what I did for my 12 M students is I actually, um, when I knew I was going to be away. Hi, 12 M and Eve. Um, um, and Eve, I come away today. Um, I'm not going to get the opportunity to do this face to face, but um, I thought it might be useful for me to talk you through the handout that is um, being made available for you today on the and it is the instruction. So you can see that for students again who um, possibly struggle with reading a whole lot of text, you can take them on a guided tour of a handout or any resources that you're looking at. Your students could use this to um, verbally annotate a poem or a, a text that you're looking at. So you might be looking at you know, a, a video playing on the computer screen and they could be talking to it and annotating it as they're going, explaining the use of um, screen, you know, ty types of little screen um, camera shots that they're using, or a poem and sort of annotating the language techniques they're using in the effect. But for as a teacher, I think this is really powerful. Annotating, you know, if they've got a big um, achievement standard that they're going to have to do, they're not ever going to go off to an NCA site and read the actual achievement standard. But if you gave a potted highlights tour of an achievement standard, um, they may well view or listen to that. And again, that's something that you can construct in the space of a few minutes and have uploaded onto your Moodle site. Again, it gives you that embed code, so you can have it as a nice window within your Moodle site, or you can simply have a web link 
that takes them, say, from your Moodle site out to screen it and watch that. And um, it's, again, it's another quick and easy online tool um, that doesn't involve you downloading anything. You do need to sign up, but if you've got a Facebook account, you can sign up with that, or you can use your school email address, and, and um, just it's very quick to register and join. And it's well worthwhile. It's a really powerful tool. I also like the fact that it limits you to five minutes. I think that's quite powerful. The fact that it forces you to try and be succinct. I know that's one thing I can lack. Um, I can be a bit verbose. So if I have to get my point across in a short space of time, that can be really useful as well. Oops. Oops. The next thing is um, something I poached from Albany Senior High School, and it's something they do as an entire school, not just in their English department. But they're very much an open source school who likes to put everything out there in the public and they like to see themselves as contributing to um, the wider sort of creative knowledge building out there. And one thing they do is they use Wiki Educator very well. So it looks very similar to, um, to Wikipedia, but it's designed for education purposes. And you simply go in there and it works like, a little bit like any sort of website, but it's very much set up so that you can um, do it in this way. So this is an example of a collaborative, co-constructed textbook for The Hunger Games that was um, overseen by two of the staff members at Albany Senior School, but um, their students also contributed it to a number of ways. Now they do everything on Wiki Educator. You can go in and you can see all of their policies, you can see all of their handbooks and all of their staff handbooks, um, for every department because they believe in that idea of this is what we're doing, it's out there, you can access it, you can comment on it and um, you can also collaborate with them if you want. But you can set up who can add to it and um, I think it's a really powerful idea. I like this idea that it's, it's a very open resource and you know often we do these things in the classroom and I, I co-construct things with my students and we keep it inside the classroom and whilst it's good for our students you know why not be building a resource that we can, we can then come back to at a later time or be accessed by all students in your school or um, students from around the world. So you'll see there that it's set up like any sort of normal study guide. It's got the different sections and um, if you go into any one uh, you will um, see that it works pretty much like a um, website or a wiki, but it's sort of got an overarching structure and philosophy that lends itself to being a, um, a sort of more robust educational document. So that, you know, there's things they have to learn about what's appropriate to put up there. Things need to be Creative Commons. Um, they need to have had permission to put stuff up there. So it makes them be more mindful about what they're putting out there on the internet because they do have to comply um, with the regulations of the wiki educator side. But um, if you're interested in it, it's really it's worth checking out what Albany um, Senior are doing and also uh, worth checking out what they're doing at all um, of their other wiki educator sites. I think it's, it's an interesting idea being that sort of open to the world. Um, another resource that I'm looking to start using but haven't done so so far is LiveBinder. LiveBinder basically works as an online binder. So you go in there and you can collect and you can have sections in your online folder. It's, I guess there's similarities to things like Delicious which is that online bookmarking tool. But this one is actually more sort of structured in terms of it has your tabs and your subjects. So for a student, I could imagine it could work really well that you could have a section, a divider in each um, within your binder that's related to each subject, and on their netbook or their laptop, they simply have a little um, live binder it um, tab that lives up on their um, menu at the top. And if they're on a web page that looks useful, they just binder it, and it goes directly into their um, live binder, and they can put it in the right section. So it's a really effective way of creating an online binder of resources that is truly multimedia. So any videos you find, handouts, you can also upload your own resources so you can have a mixture of online and own files uploaded and filed really clearly within um, LiveBinder. So I've embedded 
in here. All, I'll make this um, presentation available afterwards, and it's got all of the hyperlinks to these resources in it, and there's also a number of videos that you can watch within it, one of them being an introduction um, to LiveMinder. So if you think that sounds like a useful tool, particularly when you're doing research, um, you can find out more from the video on there. This was one of the ideas that I, I endeavour to try. It feels a bit beyond me at the moment, but Kevin Honeycutt um, at Learning at School spoke about this within his presentation. And it was about how he was using um, Google SketchUp, or teachers were using Google SketchUp, to um, materialise settings and locations within texts. And he was, um, his example was students who were struggling to engage with the House of Usher, and what he set them, or the teacher that he was talking about set them as a task, was to reconstruct the House of Usher on Google SketchUp. And um, of course, for them to be able to do that, they had to really closely read the text. And he saw it as a way of sort of maybe tricking your students to do a level of close reading that they might never have done in the past, particularly in relation to setting. And the nice thing about Google SketchUp is you don't have to have any architectural or design skills because it has a whole lot of menus where you make a square, you make it a cube, you put a roof on, you put the materials and then you can start spinning it around and you can go in and you can do a 3D tour through the house and you can add your wallpapers and add your furniture and you can add your cat and your man and your dog and it's, it's a really, really incredible powerful tool. It's free so we can download um, the Google SketchUp software onto our laptops, or if you have trouble doing that, Mark can do it for you. There's no issue with that whatsoever. And it's something that you or your students can use, and within minutes, you could be recreating Macomb County and get them to really think about how it's set out to scale, which parts of the city you know, it is. And you can do whole cities, or you could do a single house or a single building. And again, I won't play the video here now, it's in there for the presentation for you to refer back to. But um, it's, you know, for those students that you know, need sort of prodding and stretched a bit further and you know might like to engage with this sort of thing, it struck me as a really exciting, powerful tool to imagine and visualise 3D those settings. Yes? Can you get it so that, like not just on your laptop, but so that kids and groups can also... Yes, yeah, it? it's like with Google, you can share it and co-construct it within it, yeah, yeah. And then you can take your final production and you can embed it and then you can go back and you can do walks through it and all sorts of things. So yeah, it's got lots of potential for them to, to work as a group over, over time on a project like that. So for me it's a bit big at the moment and I haven't quite got there, but it's in one of my to-do lists later on um, down the year. It's something that I think could be a, a really exciting um, way into spending some more time focusing on setting and imagining it. You know, we often get our kids to sketch up a picture of a, a place and it's very much a, you know, a one-dimensional sketch and how amazing if they could actually you know, realise those houses and start walking into them um, and get a feeling for it that way. So that's an exciting to do thing. Um, one of the things that I got to do at the um, Emerging Leaders Ignition Conference at, a sem um, at Albany Senior High School over the holidays is we had a series of Ignite presentations. And I won't play you a presentation of me speaking while I'm up here presenting to you, because that would be a bit strange, but I have embedded it for you if you're interested in it. Funnily enough, I was talking about teaching as inquiry, um, as a way for leading change within school. So I talk about three different examples of um, how I've been involved in using teaching as inquiry. One going back to when I was um, leading the English department at Auckland Girls, we used it as a tool for reviewing um, our practice and for teachers making change that supported their students and their teachers are very much in an English context and then talking about how we've been using it in an, um, as a means of integrating e-learning and keeping the focus on um, learning and that the importance of that inquiry cycle um, to us becoming sort of better practitioners, but also that idea that it's ongoing, that we're constantly going through this teaching as inquiry cycle, um, looking at ways to improve and what a powerful tool that is. But I think Ignite presentations, or otherwise known as Pecha Kucha presentations, 
a really powerful way of getting your students to do a presentation. So I'm going to get my year nines to do a Ignite presentation later this term in hope of getting them involved in a um, inter-school student Ignite presentation at ULEARN 12 later in the year. We're going to be handpicking some students. So this is something I'll share with all of you and if you've got students that you think would like to participate in this. Um, we're looking at working sort of collaboratively around the country to bring some students together to do some Ignite presentations at ULEARN 12. Basically, um, Ignite is a, a talk that is about an idea. It can be any idea and it should be something you're really passionate about. So an idea or a concept. It has to be exactly five minutes long. You have to have exactly 20 seconds that auto um, sort of move on every 15 seconds. I did not realise how hard that was going to be until I did it. That idea, you know when you do those creative writing exercises where you get them to do something in exactly 85 words and you have to make them prune down and flesh out. That, that, those sort of constraints are incredible at making you really streamline your thinking and go, okay, how am I going to get this complete message across in only this many slides and in only that many seconds per slide? And um, it was a really interesting exercise to try and do that. Um, and I felt like I learned a lot going through the process myself. So it's something that I want my students to engage in. So my year nine speech is going to be in the form of Ignite presentations. And obviously if you feel like five minutes for all of your students is too long, you could tweak that structure. Um, but it might be really nice for them to know that they're part of an international movement. You can go on to the international Ignite sites and see um, Ignite presentations from around the world and um, Pitch Cooch presentations from around the world. So it's a nice idea that they're part of something that is a global movement about idea sharing. And I've got in there um, a, some tips that Mark Osborne shared that I think he stole from somewhere else about what makes an effective Ignite presentation. So that's there for you to share with your students. But it's, it's, it's a really lovely and simple idea that it's simply about sharing an idea that you're passionate about and leaving it as open as that, but you're having very strict structures that you have to adhere to, and it really makes you formulate um, a pretty sound presentation. All of the presentations were really, really good at um, Ignite, and I can send through a link of um, the presentations from the conference and some earlier ones. And you can also come along with me to an Ignite evening later this term. I think it's June the 21st, Takapuna, um, I think it's Takapun Normal, uh, hosting the next Ignite Evening for Auckland Educators. That's part of the Emerging Leaders um, group. It's a lovely group of people. It's um, teachers, middle leaders and principals from all over the Auckland area that just come together for a big nerd fest. And uh, we meet together at least once a term. Last term we went along to, was it last term or the end of last year? We went along to Epsom Normal Primary School and they took us for a tour of their, um, their new spaces. They've just knocked down a whole lot of walls um, to turn very traditional classrooms into lo um, open learning spaces. So we do things like that. So it's, there's a whole lot of really neat meetups and um, presentations that take place. And there's always food and wine and beer, which makes it good for me. So, the next thing that um, really inspired me when I went along to learning at schools is I went along to Christian Long's um, presentation, and he's known for doing big projects. He is an English teacher, and he now works for an international think tank company, but um, he did a couple of really cool projects with his 10th grade English class um, last year and the year before. One of them was the TEDx Classroom Project, where they curated the entire... TED website, and at that stage there wasn't as many presentations on there as there is at the moment. His students um, had to engage with um, eight plus talks that they analysed, and then they had to write up blog posts about um, those TED talks. It went beyond that though, they had, to inter um, they had to engage with the wider world. They were being rewarded on how much they connected internationally with people, and if TED Talk people came to them, they were not allowed to approach any of the TED Talk speakers, but there were bonus points awarded for those people that got their message out there to a point that they um, got TED speakers in making contact with them. And um, it was a really great project. He's got some lovely examples of um, when they started having lunch and learn Skype chats. They started having some of the TED Talk presenters who knew that these students were 
um, analysing their tech talks and writing up these blog posts about them. And um, the, the um, tech talk people started contacting them about it because they were interested in it. And what started happening is that these presenters from TED started becoming personal mentors of the students. And he showed us, um, it's been a bit slow here. This girl here, one of their final projects was after that, um, that analyzed and written these blog posts about the TED Talks, is they then had to construct their own TED Talk in response. And um, what happened is she, she was really into performance poetry and she was analyzing a whole lot of TED Talks about performance poets. One of them got in contact with her and he ended up being her mentor. So um, the video here shows her performing her TED Talk to the TED Talk guy that she'd written, originally written about and him giving her feedback about her performance via Skype. And he was, you know, Christian Long, he's hilarious. So, uh, you know, in the first few minutes, he's sitting there going, oh my goodness, he's sort of got sparkling blue eyes and blonde hair swished to the side. And you think, oh, he's just all charisma. But you could see what he did with his students. He simply was made them believe that they had the power to connect with anyone and that they had the power to get their stuff out there and um, make, these connect make these really powerful educational connections for themselves. And they did. And the result was that they ended up with these educators and these speakers ending up being their, um, their personal um, sort of mentors, in a sense. One way that I'm looking at tackling this, I'm going a bit more local with my project, um, I'm looking at actually creating a similar project, but I want to use the Pacifica um, poetry of the New Zealand Electronic Poetry Centre. I'm going to get my girls to curate, and we're going to do a project. I will contact, I will actually um, contact Selena to get her permission just to make sure that she's comfortable um, with that happening. But, you know, I want to show my students that they can do something like this that actually also um, makes them engage with a set of texts and a resource that I think is incredible and underutilised. I love the New Zealand Electronic Poetry Centre, and um, I would love to see students starting to engage with that. Um, more readily and also to me it's something that needs to be a bit captured and updated and, and having a fresh voice and so I'm going to get my year nine students to engage with it and they're going to be adding their own fresh voice to the New Zealand electronic uh, um, poetry collection. So that's going to be my version of a TEDx um, project. He also, this is where it started, he started with the Alice project which was a similar idea, but it was more involved, um, it was simply focused on um, the annotated Alice version of Alice in Wonderland, and his students were deconstructing and, um, and working in teams to write blogs, and their instructions were they had to again get people to engage with this. So they were putting it out on Twitter. Their whole aim was to make it global. So they made sure it was on a public website. They were all taught about doing this safely. They were all taught about um, how to engage with the wider world on the internet in an appropriate way. Um, but again, they were being rewarded for how much they engaged with people around the world in their project. So, you know, they ended up with, um, you know, academics that ended up being their online um, jurors that actually went through and they did feedback on their blog post for them. And, um, and worked with them. So he started with the Alice project and then the, I think the TEDx project came next and um, after that he's been working with a, um, a think tank group, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but I'll forward that information to you. So that's um, what I mean by a big project. That idea of letting your students realise that they can connect with the wider world through their English work and um, that there's an audience out there that they can engage with. And um, if you go through it, it's just got some links that explain exactly how they did it. And again, the nice thing is, like Albany Senior, he's been really transparent about the project. All of the resources, the whole structure, reflections on how it went, the students' comments on what they thought of the project are all there for the world to see within that website. And um, then I just wanted to go through some oldies but goodies. Um, you've probably been shown War Wisher before. Um, but it's a, another really simple, quick to use resource um, that is a lovely way to create what I refer to as a virtual knowledge wall. Once upon a time, when I had a classroom of my own, I used to always have knowledge walls. And so you'd have a space, and if you've got a topic, 
that you're studying, it's a space where people have to share their knowledge. So if they come across a good resource or they have a good idea or they've got something to share, it goes up on the knowledge wall. Um, wall Wisher is a really awesome way to create a virtual version of a knowledge wall. So all you could do is you go to Wall Wisher, you don't have to sign up or join in, um, you build a wall and you give it a topic and then you're given a URL so kids can link to that page and it's there for as long as you need it to be there. And if they go to it, they can put stickies, electronic stickies on that wall. By clicking on it, they can either identify themselves or they can leave themselves as anonymous and they can either write a response there and um, that's their way of just writing up a normal sticky or they can post up pictures, videos, URL links to other things. So if you imagine you were studying a topic and you wanted a virtual knowledge wall for them to go in and share any good resources they've found or have any ideas, you could use a, a wall wisher for doing that. And it's a really nice multimedia knowledge wall that you can build online and you can embed, the, embed that back into your Moodle course or link to that from your Moodle course. An answer garden is a little different but equally a really useful tool. What it builds for you is a real-time word cloud. So it's designed for um, something that is just like a one-word response or a couple of words. You can only put in um, 25 characters or 20 characters. So say if you wanted to do a brainstorm about, um, and they had to give a one-word response to an idea or a question, you go and create the answer garden, you write in your um, question, and then they simply go to it through a URL link, or again, you can actually embed it in your um, Moodle page, and there's a little box for them to write their answer. And the more people that write that word, the bigger the word becomes. So if you're trying to get a sense of something about what people think is the key idea, or the key um, sort of image that comes to mind from a piece of text, um, you can get them to go in there and write it up and the more times people repeat an idea it becomes bigger and that sort of is a way of gauging what is the most popular or um, common idea in a group and you can do that over time because you can simply embed it in there and it can live in that space for as long as you need it. And again, you don't need to sign up, you don't need to join um, Answer Garden, it's simply something that um, you go to the website, follow a couple of steps and it instructs you how to embed it back into your space and I can show you um, how to embed that into Moodle if you're interested in using it. Another couple of resources that I wanted to um, talk about and that I want to re-engage with, I used to be really good at using Digistore but I haven't um, used it. Who uses Digistore? Has anyone used it? You've used it Catherine? And um, it's a really powerful library of digital resources. Um, for instance, if you're doing Anzac as a topic, like Rose for the Anzac Boys or, or something like that, or you're doing World War poetry of any sort or anything like that, you can go into here and you can have access to a whole lot of digital archives. So you can get original newspaper clippings or a whole lot of old radio um, recordings and all of things like that. And the nice thing is that you can embed those back into your course. We're just trying to relocate the school login um, it seems they've just changed um, the login process and um, so Catherine's going to let us know that once we, we work it out. Um, another thing you can to do, do in Digistore, and I've got a link to it from that page I shared with you the other day about teaching film, is you can actually create a learning path within Digistore, which means that you can collect together a whole lot of resources, so you might want them to compare an old poem with a poster, with a little movie clip all around the same theme and you can embed them as one um, resource after another and write instructions of what they need to do and I've, I've done it in the past um, with rabbit proof fence and um, some of the um, archive footage around Aboriginal issues. So you could like put the clip, they've got um, a lot of Australian films funnily enough in here, so there's little clips from Australian films and then you could find some original archive footage and get them to look at the two and, um, and do that. And when you put it together as a teacher, you get a URL that you can just paste into your Moodle site, they don't have to do anything, they click on that and it takes them to that learning path. Um, I'll send through a resource that tells you how to do that if you're interested in looking a little bit further and once we've got the login, you'll be able to access it. Um, and have a look through. 
The other thing that's coming, um, becoming an amazing resource, they're doing a whole lot of work on it at the moment, is the National Library's Digital New Zealand. This is another source for incredible archive um, footage. So, for instance, if I wanted to look for something on, um, say if I was doing something around Parihaka or um, Anzac again, it's got some really neat aspects to it. So, you put your, your word in there. Oops. And I can't spell. Okay, and I can go and first of all it will bring up all of the resources.